Welcome to the Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon. Here's today's teaching. Well, happy Lord's Day again. This is a very special message. Uh, I was debating whether we should be spending one or two more Sundays going through the book of Revelation, and I decided to keep it all together, so today will be our last study through this book. It marks our 93rd Sunday in Revelation. And if we count B-sides, tomorrow will be 185 studies through this book. So, so if you have any questions, look it up. <laughs> uh, if you're wondering what's next, I don't know. Don't ask me these things. I'm letting God pick. I, uh, I, th- I do think I want to do something next week on the will of God. And then I've thought about doing some studies through the second person of the Trinity or a third person. I want to do something on the Holy Spirit. Uh, I know I want to go through 1 John, so we're going to be hopping and having fun for a while. I was thinking about Elijah, too. I got the story of Elijah stuck in my head. Um, so there's fun stuff ahead, but we won't get bogged down in a long book for quite a while. Um, we can hop around. Uh, also, uh, there's so much here today I couldn't share. It's probably going to be a hair long. I'm doing my best, uh, but there's so much on tomorrow's Bible study. So if you, if you want to wrap up the book with us, that's a good place to... Start. Uh, Now, Revelation. This has been quite a book. We've been shown the throne room of God, uh, which what an honor to see the inmost holy place in the the temple of God in, 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 in heaven. We've been told of worship in heaven, how God likes to be worshiped. And it's not all about us and how we feel. It's all about his goodness and largeness and greatness. Uh, We saw uh, the plans of Satan through tyrannical government uh, that has been described in great detail. And we know in 1 John that there are those with the spirit of the Antichrist today. So when we see large tyrannical government opposing the church, we know that is um, somewhat reminiscent of the last satanic kingdom to come. And as Christians, we should oppose those things. Uh, We saw, we have been informed of how the blood of the martyrs actually leads to the defeat of Satan. You actually oppose tyrannical evil, not by resisting so much by fisticuffs or guns, but by laying your life down for the glory of God. We also saw, we've been given new details of the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, where the church will be for the rest of eternity. So this book has been of immense encouragement uh, to the church. Our home has been described. When we think of our eternity, remember, we're not going to be on a cloud somewhere in a diaper playing harps forever. Uh, We're going to be in the New Jerusalem, uh, this magnificent city. Um, And it has been described as absolutely certain to come. So it's been an incredible book, but now our conclusion. So let's, uh, I'd like to turn your attention this morning to the 22nd chapter of Revelation. And we're going to begin at verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more, and they will need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And I'm hoping you're remembering some of our studies on the light and refraction and reflection through this book. But the actual book of Revelation is communicated in Saminos, Revelation 1-1, in images. Well, now the images have ended, and now the conclusion to the book begins at verse 6. So let's look. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servant what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So, pause. Four times in today's study, we read two different Greek words that are transliterated in English as soon. Jesus four times is telling you he is coming soon. And and there's much we can gather about this, but certainly what we need to sense as we read these over and over again is the believer has to live in a sense of urgency. 
We need to live as if God could return today. We need to live, uh, and we, we, it's true that we're commanded to rest. Did you know that? You're commanded to rest, but that doesn't mean we're commanded to rest all the time. <laughs> we also need a sense of urgency to work hard and strive towards godly things. I, uh, whatever you think about John Calvin, he certainly was a faithful man, and he was almost at his deathbed, and he was working long days writing and writing and writing, and his, his aides that would come to him would be like, John, it's okay, man. <laughs> <laughs> you've, spent, you've laid down your l- whole life for this. It's time to rest. And he goes, do you expect my Lord to find me idle when he returns? I mean, he's on his deathbed in hospice and he's vi- vi- working with his entire being to the glory of God. This, this sense of urgency is something that is necessary for his people. And four times in today's reading, God says soon. Today's passage is so permeated with this urgency, it's almost as if the closing dialogue, this conclusion, anyone ever seen Jeopardy and the music starts? Or a ticking clock in like a bomb defusing scene, you know? And there's this clock that's running through this whole conclusion and it's saying soon, soon, soon. We need to sense that and feel that. Verse eight, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things, and when I heard them, uh, heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, worship God. How great is that? So the messenger speaks in verse six and seven, and John, so overwhelmed, falls down and worships, but he speaks in verse 8, and John testifies that he, the disciple whom Jesus loved, who is later described as the father of the church, John is the one who heard and saw these things. So this is not Joseph Smith putting his head into a hat and getting fresh revelations. (laughs) This is the apostle John hearing from God Almighty himself. This book carries with it every bit as Paul would announce his letters. This book carries with it apostolic authority, with the authority of of Christ as a sent one. He is the one who heard and saw these things. So John is saying, I, as an apostle of the Lord, say, follow this, and this is trustworthy and true. Verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Anyone familiar with the book of Daniel? What happened to that book of Daniel? What was supposed to happen to that one? It was sealed up. I don't know who said it, but you win a gold star. Uh, The book was sealed up for a time to be revealed at a later time. Now, people like to argue when that revealing was. I think it was before Christ as Jesus comes and says, I'm the son of man in Daniel. But the book was sealed up for a time. But now the reverse is true. This letter of Revelation is not to be sealed up, but is to remain wide open. This book is wide open to us. And listen, couldn't God have sealed this book away for us to dig up in 2023 in some cave somewhere? I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. But instead, God gave this book to the church uh, through every generation, through every age to glean from and learn from. And so, that every generation may have the hope of the return of the Lord. The first century church couldn't wait for Jesus to return 2,000 years ago. And Calvin in the late 1500s couldn't wait for the Lord to return. And Edwards and Luther and Owen and Spurgeon and through Christostom and Clement of Alexandria, Clement of Rome, all the way through Theodor to cry, all these th- people through all of time have been eagerly expecting the return of God. What a gift this letter is to the church. It says, keep your lamps lit and be ready. Expect your husband to come in the blink of an eye. Soon, soon, soon. And we're to live as if we believe it. Verse 11. This is heavy. 
Let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. The prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 3.27 said, let those who will hear, hear, and let those who refuse to hear, refuse. Now, some commentators like to come to this point in Revelation and say that Jesus is saying that the righteous should continue to be righteous and the evil should continue to be evil because Jesus is coming back so soon there's no time to repent. But I don't believe that's what he's saying here. Because how many times in this book have we seen Jesus want people to repent? I mean, it's over and over and over again. What I believe Jesus is doing, I believe he's using a rhetorical um, a tactic, technique to communicate I, he, he's describing two paths. One that will be receive reward and a path that will receive judgment. You notice no one's going to get into heaven and somewhere be in the middle. <laughs> you can't have a, fit, a foot on both sides of that, of that line. And so two paths are described. One re will receive righteous, reward. One will receive judgment. And Jesus in verse 12 is making a truly shock, shocking statement. To the righteous, he is encouraging righteousness. And to the unrighteous, I believe, he's not saying he wants them to continue to be evil. But Jesus seems to be saying to the faithless, to the wicked, go ahead. Go ahead, keep being evil. And when I return... I will reward you as such. That's a warning. <laughs> That's, that should scare the socks off of anyone in here living in sin. <laughs> you know, St. Uh, Fulgentius from the early 6th century, he commented on this passage, there is no forgiveness of sins if penance is not done at this very moment. And here's what I know. I've been working at this church for 20 years. Can you believe it? I've earned every gray hair in my beard, right? <laughs> no, most of you are wonderful. Uh, some of you. <laughs> now we have the best church. I brag about you guys all the time. Um, but I've seen countless people come through these doors, as I'm sure many of you have. And they come here and they get all stirred up and they're like, I'm back at church. <laughs> And I get so excited, it's like, that sounds great to me, but how many times do these people, they fall away? They come, they get fired up, they get stirred, and they just fizzle away from church, or, or sometimes worse, they stay, but they don't ever change. They, you know, remember, we're supposed to come as we are, not stay as we are. We are to change before God. And then not only do they not change again, they fizzle away. And didn't Jesus warn us about this in the parable of the sower, Matthew 13? Some would start to spring up like they were going to bear life. And then the worries of the world choked them out. And I remember in my 20s, I was reading a Charles Spurgeon sermon because that's what all 20-year-olds do. I don't know why. It's just what I loved. <laughs> and he gave an analogy, and I swear, it, I think of it all the time. And he describes two men coming to a wide river bank. And in my mind, I always picture like the Mississippi, though he probably wasn't. And two men come to a river bank and they both have to cross. And one man says, I'm going over. And he starts making the walk and he almost gets swept away, maybe to his death, but he makes it to the other side and he turns around and he's huffing and puffing. He says, come on, you can make it to the buddy that was, hadn't crossed. And he goes, that's okay, go on with that without me. I'll wait for all the water to go by. <laughs> I think of that all the time. Because <laughs> that's exactly what it's like dealing with our sins. I'm going to wait till this gets easier. I'm going to wait till it's opportune. You know, I'll stop sleeping outside of marriage until we're married. You know, it's like we, we come up with all of these things waiting for water to go. It, it'll never, the Mississippi's not gonna, all the water's not just gonna pass one day. The point is it'll never be easy because of our flesh, because of our sins, because of the old man that's inside of us. He, you really want your way. But who's on the throne? It must be the Lord. 
And so here's what I can tell you from experience. There are moments in all of our lives where God's Spirit so stirs us to do the right things. You know those moments in your life where God just grabs you and you know what you must do. And sometimes to our everlasting shame, don't we ignore that? And then sometimes a year, two years, five years, 10 years, a lifetime goes by and we never gave this thing to God. We choose to wait for the water to go by What ends up happening is we have a lifetime without genuine commitment to the Lord, with no real dedication. And this is what Jesus is speaking about. Let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy. If you do not want to hop into that water and cross, if you do not want to cleanse yourself of your sins, then you've made your choice. What Jesus is saying right now is absolutely horrifying to those who refuse to give up their sins and change. And you know, I I just for a moment want to explain this. So many people think it's difficult to go to hell. It is not hard to go to hell. It's the easiest thing to do in the world. Just don't change. Coast on. Continue to believe in the myth of self-autonomy. Jesus is saying, fine, choose you. But I am returning. And I will repay you for how you have behaved. You know, and we don't want to mistake here. No one is saved because of their righteousness. We're not saved because we've given just enough things to God that the scales now tip like saved. <laughs> no, no. But real faith manifests itself in obedience. If you really believe it, you change. You change. The path of salvation is one of repentance, righteousness, and holiness. But the entrance to salvation, as we're going to read in a little bit, is free and as easy as can be. But again, we, we have to be acutely aware that when we say that we are Christians, we must then follow the path of Christ. And what is Jesus called here? What is Jesus call uh, sin, unfaithfulness. Remember he calls it, where, where is it? I gotta, I gotta look at it again. I wanna make sure I give the right wordings. He calls evil doing evil and filthy. And isn't that what sin is? Isn't sin filthy? It's dirty. It literally is described as dirty clothes or in Jude it says there's literally poop on you. <laughs> You ever change a diaper and get poop on you? (laughs) Oh, God, and I have boys. It's like they know when to pee, you know? The second that diaper's off. (laughs) I'm just going to get them back when I'm in diapers. So that's the plan. (laughs) It just struck me. Oh, yeah, that'll be. I'll get them. I'll get them. I'm going to remember every bit of it. Uh, (laughs) But sin is evil and filthy. And when we delight in it, it's like a pig in mud. It's like this is not, God has such better things for you. And then what does he call the right path? He calls it the path of righteousness and holiness. Righteousness, if we want to think of Psalm 23, are the paths of righteousness, the, the wagon tracks. The, 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 you ever been walking through the woods and there's something's been walked on so long it's just like a divot in the road? Those are the paths of righteousness, the paths that God's people have walked for thousands of years. It's, it's the king's path. And then the other path, of course, is, is, is the path of holiness. This is the other part of the equation. What is holiness? Holiness all through the scriptures means separation. You, as a believer, are to look different than everyone else. You are separated unto God, which means you're separated from those who oppose God. How do we look different than the rest of the world? Because we're growing in the image of Christ. We must look different than the rest of the world because the world killed him when when he came. And the more like Christ we look, the more they're going to want to kill us too. 
Let's keep reading. Verse 13. I'm trying to hurry, but this is not going good. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. You know, we're called to wash our robes before we enter the city, the new Jerusalem. And I believe this is a picture of repentance, of cleansing ourselves from all defilement. We're told in Revelation 7, 14, I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, Ready? Here we go. This is us. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You are to wash your sins, your stain-filled garments, in the blood of the Lamb. And when you come out of that blood, you're not red. You're sparkling, Mr. Clean White. Sparkling clean. Christianity, salvation, it's all about the blood. It's all about the blood of Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation, as Paul would say. And I also, I find it fascinating that there are seven blessings, seven blessings in the book of Revelation, and this is the last. The great and final blessing of this book is for those who are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. They are given a whole, a complete, a seven blessing. The one who washes in the blood of the Lamb are those who have right to the tree of life in the new Jerusalem. And what I also find so interesting is that this verb wash is in the active voice present tense, meaning and indicating it's an ongoing washing. It's an ongoing repentance rather than a singular wash. And I talk about this all the time. I just got done talking about this. There is nowhere in the Bible where someone makes a decision for Christ but doesn't follow him. Jesus never got done a sermon and said, everyone who believes this, raise your hand. You're now all saved. What does he say? Follow me. It's an active obedience to the Lord. The Christian life is one spent washing of continual repentance. Had anyone been saved more than two minutes? You know that's true. Aren't you constantly killing new sins in your life? If, we, if you lived to 1,001 years old, on your 1,000th birthday, you'd still be repenting of new sins. That's just what's in our heart. I, I forget who says it, but our hearts are idol factories. It's true. We just produce, produce, produce things we have to give to God. And the Christian life is one of continual washing, of striving for righteousness and holiness. And it is these, those who are washing, Jesus says, has access to the tree of life. And this is an obvious note yet again, but we are not saved because of our righteousness. Again, at the same time, it is the saved, though, that behave righteously. <laughs> we desire righteousness. And that's the clear teaching of the New Testament. We are saved by grace alone through faith alone. But once you receive it, you change. You come as you are. You do not stay as you are. Verse 15. Outside are the dogs. Sorry, pet lovers. <clears throat> the sorcerers and the sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehoods. Uh, God doesn't pick a bone with one animal. This is referencing to people. And the last list of those not allowed into heaven in the New Jerusalem, we've addressed every single one of these items on this list, but there's a striking addition to this vice list that we haven't seen anywhere else, and that is the dogs. So what does God mean by humans who act like dogs? And there seems to be one of two clear options. This may be referring to homosexuality, as we compare this to the patristic fathers in Romans chapter one. Uh, but what I do believe this is actually getting at is how Peter used the term in 2 Peter 2.22. Peter described apostates, those who accept Jesus Christ and walked away as dogs who eat their own vomit. Mm. For a human to act like a dog is for a human to reject its humanity, its human dignity, its human status. Dogs are not sons of God. God's sons and daughters are sons of God. 
And believers who walk away from the faith, who turn their back on Jesus at the last, by choosing to cling to their sins, they have rejected the good things that God has given them to live a more beastly life. A life of emotions without reasoning. Do you know people like this? Would they just follow however they feel? They sleep around because this is how they feel. They run their mouth because this is how they feel. They blow up in rage because this is how they feel. This is my truth, right? And they're like brute beasts, unreasonable animals who eat their own vomit thinking of the garden. Remember when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they sewed together some fig leaves? And what did God do? He said, nope. (laughs) I'm going to make you a different pair of clothes. By the way, God's the first hunter in the Bible. He he clothed them in animal skins. Um, But he clothed them in fur. And the point is, you don't get to clothe yourself in the garden because you've rejected it. You now are dressed like a beast. And this is what happens. Those who are not allowed into the kingdom of heaven are those who follow their passions and lusts and desires, completely depart from order and rule. That God is not on the throne of their life, they're on the throne of their own life, and they're delusional. (laughs) The dogs will not enter. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. So first John had testified that he had certainly heard these things. Now Jesus himself declares that this message not only comes from John, it comes from him. This book not only carries with it apostolic authority, it carries with it Yahweh authority. (laughs) This is God's book. This message is from the Lord. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. The Holy Spirit in the church, or anyone listening to this boy, a book, they are to look at Jesus and desire for him to return. Did you know that? You are supposed to want Jesus to come back. If Jesus returning sounds like a bad deal, you got something going on that's not appropriate. (laughs) You should want the Lord to return. It's something that every single believer should desire for, should long for. The Holy Spirit is inside of the bride, the church, and should produce in us believers a longing for the return of the Lord, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Then it says, and let the one who is thirsty... Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. Here's a really interesting dynamic. As the church longs for the return of the Lord, God has an open invitation for the world to come to him. The same water of life that was offered to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, this living water of everlasting life is offered to all. And so please hear me. Salvation is free. (laughs) How wonderful is that? You do not need to ascend Machu Picchu to find the Lord. I wouldn't make it, unless they have food carts along the way. You don't need to keep 316 commandments of Torah to make it. You don't need to strap a suicide vest and blow up some infidel somewhere to make it. You don't need to knock on a thousand doors in suits and bicycles to make your way into heaven and maybe you're one of the 144,000. Salvation is free. We have the greatest news in the universe. You're broken. You know you're broken. But I know the great physician, and it's free health care. <laughs> you are a sinner in need of a savior, and he offers free saving. Anyone who is thirsty, which means someone has to acknowledge they're thirsty, don't they? 
When fun, someone finally says, God, I am spiritually dehydrated. I am empty. Salvation is as easy as receiving a glass of water. <laughs> that is what is described. It's as free as saying, God, I'll take that cup now. Saved. Think of the thief on the cross. Did he ever memorize one Bible verse? Did he attend one catechism class? Was he baptized? How about his Holy Communion experience? Today you will be with me in paradise. Free. We have the best news in the world. Why would we be ashamed to share it? How silly of us. How sinful of us. Verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is extraordinarily incredible. This come, Lord Jesus, come, is actually a Greek translation of an Aramaic phrase. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Why didn't someone tell me? But I found out. And it's a Greek translation of an Aramaic phrase for, and you've probably heard this word before, Maran Atha. This is the Greek translation of the Aramaic Maran Atha, meaning come, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. The phrase, come, Lord, Maranatha, was a phrase so often associated with the early church as a term of great hope. As we would say good morning or have a good night, they would say, Maranatha. Maybe Jesus comes while we're sleeping. Wouldn't that be great? Maranatha. The return of the Lord from the beginning of this movement, from the beginning of the found Pentecost, the return of the Lord has been our great expectation, our great comfort, and our great hope. This is why Paul concluded his benediction in 1 Corinthians 16 with Maranatha. And this is why when, when we read, so I, I love the Patristic Fathers, I love early church manuscripts. One of the earliest manuscripts the church has that is not canonical, it's not canonized, it's not in the 66 books, though it seems to be written by one of the disciples of the apostles or one of the disciples of the apostles. It's called the Didache. And in it, it says this, remember Lord your church to deliver it from all evil and to make it perfect in your love and gather it from the four winds sanctified for your kingdom, which you have prepared for it for yours is the power and the glory forever. How cool is that? Let, let grace come Come and let this world pass away. Hosanna to the son of David. If anyone who is holy, let him come. If anyone is not so, let him repent. Maranatha, amen. This is our battle cry. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Maranatha. This is our great hope, Jesus returning. But remember, the return of the Lord is the greatest earthly experience outside of salvation any Christian can have. It is the best day for the church, but it is also the worst day for the world. The thing that produces in us such hope produces such dread to those who reject it, which is why we need to be urgent when we think about the return of the Lord. We have to let people know God is coming. And if you're not following him, this is bad news. But good news, salvation is free. And you start asking if people are thirsty. <laughs> Do you know you're broken? Well, let's talk about that. Verse 21, our last verse. Can't even believe it. <clears throat> The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. The last words of the Bible. Amen. Meaning, so be it, or let it be so, or truth. 
What is the Bible? It is truth. Amen. Amen. So, uh, two closing thoughts. I can't even believe we're here. Like, I just feel like I just got like on a vacation I saved up for my whole life, you know? <laughs> Disneyland before, you know, it went crazy. No men in dresses on this vacation here. Uh, <sighs> First, over and over and over again, in today's collusion, we have been told to keep the words of this book. Let's be really honest. If you walked up to a random Christian on the street and said, how do you keep the book of Revelation? They're going to look at you like you've got a unicorn horn growing out of your face. <laughs> how do you keep this book? Because we're told to do it over and over and over again. How do you keep what is written in this book? And most people are going to say, all right, all right. Most people say, someone's picking on me in the back. Throw stones. No. Um, <clears throat> most people would say something to the effect of what? Well, wait for the return turn of the Lord. Well, okay, maybe. But there's a whole lot more in this book about the return of the Lord. The reality is, when Jesus, John, and the angel tells us to keep this word of the book, I do not believe most people know what that means. Even Martin Luther, I'm going to read it to you. Moreover, he, John, seems to be going much too far when he commends his own book so highly. Indeed, more than any other sacred book do, though they are much more important. So Martin Luther said, other books are way more important than this book. I love Luther. He's pretty dang wrong on this. And threatens that if anyone takes away anything from it, God will take away from him, etc. Again, they are supposed to be blessed who keep what is written in this book, and yet no one knows what that is to say nothing of keeping it. This is just the same as if we did not have the book at all. And there are many far better books available for us to keep. Even Martin Luther, who was a professor of the Bible, an Augustinian monk who was brilliant, a book of Romans memorized in Greek, brilliant. I mean, just brilliant. Even he had no idea what to do with this book. And again, I believe many people fall into this line of thinking. So let me, let me clarify this. The revelation of Jesus Christ was not written to scratch our curiosity. God did not write this book so that you could try to figure out what your newspaper is saying. It also was not written primarily to describe the schemes of Satan. This book was written to reveal Jesus Christ to the church. This entire book is to reveal God's heart. Jesus' heart. And part of that in Revelation is for us to see God's desire for us, his bride. And remember, Jesus said in the gospel, he who loves me keeps my commands. To Jesus, fellowship with him as his church, as his bride, is to respect him and to obey and to follow him. And do you want to know why there's such an emphasis on keeping the words of this book? And that is because to accept Jesus, to be in fellowship with Jesus, to love Jesus, is to follow him. And so what are the direct commandments to keep? What are we supposed to keep in this book? And there are a lot. So many that both the angel, Jesus, and John are all emphasizing our need for obedience to them. And we're told to not tolerate Jezebel's. If you don't know what that means, study the story of Jezebel. It'll tell you. It'll tell you to hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You know you are supposed to hate false doctrine? Yeah. You are, if I hear one more person said, God told me, and then says something outlandish, I'm going to freak out. <laughs> because a lot of people get hurt. Yeah. A lot of people get hurt. We're told to not tolerate evil men. Listen, you can love sinners, but you need to be careful about how far you bring them into your world, especially within the church. We do not leave our first love. You're not supposed to let your love for Jesus wane. If it's waning, something's happening. We're told to finish the work we started. We're told not to capitulate the liars. We are warned and encouraged several times about being faithful to the scriptures as a whole. We're told of rejecting sexual sin of not submitting to the beast 
and beastly people. There are many, many things for us to keep. And so if you really want to understand what all that means about keeping the book of Revelation, spend one hour. Spend one hour with a physical Bible and a highlighter and highlight everything that God likes is what to do and everything that God hates is what not to do. In one hour, you'll have it figured out. And you will be blessed if you do it. Because God's word says you will be blessed for those who keep the words of this book. Secondly, and finally, did you know the book of Revelation is a love story? <laughs> It began in chapter one. Remember that description of Jesus? He has eyes of fire and hair of white wool. And that's actually taken from the Song of Solomon. It was the woman's description of her husband, of her lover. And she looks, she's like looking at his lips and his strong shoulders. And <laughs> what's really interesting is the Song of Solomon ends with the lover. He's missing and she's looking for him. And the book, the Song of Solomon ends away. And the book of Revelation begins and the lover returns. In Revelation chapter two and three are written like love letters to the church. Did you know that? <laughs> love letters to the church and the bride. And throughout Revelation, Jesus is described as the new Adam who stops the dragon and the serpent from entering through to his people, from destroying the woman, from destroying the bride, the church. In Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the church is described as a city prepared as a bride for her wedding day. The book ends in a marriage ceremony. And then the last few verses of Revelation chapter 22, today's text, the conclusion, we have the bride and Jesus speaking back to and forth to each other, longing to be together. Have you ever seen two people and they're in love and they're like, oh, I love being with you. Oh, I love being with you. Oh, I miss you. I miss you more, right? That's how this book is ending. They're going back and forth to each other, the lover and their Lord. Oh, I want to be with you. I want to be with you too, right? It's this really sweet thing and she's waiting the end of the book she's waiting to get sweeped off of her feet and carried away so the book of revelation is a love story and really so is the entire bible the bible opens with a marriage do you know that between adam and eve jesus's ministry begins where at a wedding in cana and now the bible ends in a marriage between the new jerusalem and jesus consummated with christ Living inside of her is his, as her glory. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Or what Jesus said, for God so loved the world, Jesus came. As much blood and war and death and battle is in this, the book of Revelation, and really the whole Bible, from beginning to end, ultimately this is a love story. It's about God's great love for us. Isn't this exactly what Paul describes in arguably the greatest chapter in the Bible, Romans 8? Neither height nor depth nor principalities or powers, nothing will separate us from the love of God. I always think of that section in Romans 8, I'm getting sidetracked. It reminds me of the Lord of the Rings story. And Frodo's got the ring and he just faces every peril imaginable until he throws it in the volcano, right? It's like nothing will stop God's pursuit of us. Nothing will stop his love for us. And as the book unfolds, we find out that God loves us not because we're beautiful, though I'm pretty good looking. Maybe the best. Not because we're worthy. Not because we're perfect. It's because he is. And his love and his grace and his mercy are very wide. And they're very deep for his beloved. And the book ends with God promising to return to his bride and to bring us back to his house, the new Jerusalem. And with the bride longing for her husband to literally carry her away, the harpazo, the rapture. He wants, we're waiting for God to sweep us off our feet. <laughs> and this brings us back to the theme of keeping because the two are intertwined. 
There are two themes that dominated today's text, the conclusion of the book, and it's the eminent return of the Lord and our faithfulness. And so the question becomes, how is the bride, how is the church, how are we supposed to behave while our husband is away? And I believe that is what is at the heart of this book. And I believe that is what the commandments are within this book and what they ultimately add up to. How should we, the church, the bride of Christ, behave while our husband is away? Will we be unsexually unfaithful like Babylon and have many lovers? Will we sit at Jezebel's table? Will we give ourselves to the false teachings like the Nicolaitans? Will we be murderers and liars and cowards? Will we fall in love with the, with the beast and beastly people? Will we submit to kingdoms that are not the kingdom of God? Or will we remain faithful to the Lord and his kingdom? Will we keep the words of this book and remain faithful while our husband is away? Loved ones, the book of Revelation was given to the bride to encourage faithfulness and enduring faithfully to the end. I've seen so many prophecy watch programs. You ever see that? And like, we figured out the mark of the beast, you know? Social security numbers, are, are, is this the mark? We all have ID numbers. You've been marked by the beast. Vaccines have microchips. You are marked by the beast. We're always, it's, it's nonstop. <laughs> And there's endless books written about the end times, and that's fine, and that's okay. But true prophecy does not lead us to curiosity. True prophecy leads us to laying our lives down for the Lord. To receive this open letter is to bet everything you have on Jesus. If your life is roulette, push all those chips on Christ. That's what this book is saying. And it may cost you your life. Are you willing to bet everything you have on the Lord? True prophecy is to stir inside of us through the Spirit of God a resolve, a grittiness, a stubbornness, a stiff neckedness of no matter what happens, no matter how hard this gets, no matter how mean some people are, even if I have to lay down my own life, I will follow you, Jesus, to the end. I choose you. And a believer does that not to the glory of themselves. She is to be, we are to be as a beautiful bride who works to the glory of her husband. Will you lay down your life, not that people may sing songs of you <laughs> in your memory and erect statues in your honor, but will you do it for the glory of your husband who called you by name and saved sinners like us? And we're not only saved, we are his beloved. You're not gonna get into heaven, the new Jerusalem, and God's not just gonna tolerate you. He is going to love you and love you forever. That is what this book is saying. And will we answer the call? Will we be faithful when our husband is away? Let's pray. God, we love you. We, we thank you for the great love that you have for us. We thank you that you are a pursuing God and we thank you that you are returning for us. We thank you for Maranatha. Mm -hmm. We pray, God, that you would change us. We pray, God, that you would make us more lovely. We pray that you would make us more beautiful spiritually. Help us to prepare ourselves like a bride before her wedding day. God, we pray that You would help us to not be attracted to things that are vile and dirty and evil. But let us walk the king's highway. 
the paths of righteousness. God, let us be a holy and consecrated and separated people that live life for the glory of the one who saved them. Be with us now, Lord Jesus. Fill us with your good spirit. And Father, thank you for working these wonderful things for us. And in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. amen. Worship team. Oh, we have communion. Mm. I got so fired up, I forgot about communion. If you need communion, there's Rob. Let me say this before we go. This meal, I realize this is the first real carbs I've had in a while. I'm doing keto. These are the Lord's carbs, so they don't count. Um, to sit at this table, to eat this bread and drink this wine, right? is to say that you are at peace with God and that he is your hope. If you are not pursuing the Lord, do not take this meal. It says in Corinth that curses fall upon those who take from this meal inappropriately. This is not, this is not a light thing before God. God is looking down from heaven. I believe angels are filled, filling this room right now. This is a very serious matter because it declares that Jesus Christ, you, my life belongs to you. And we literally take his body inside of ourselves. It's a consummation of sorts. So we must be very serious about our commitment to God. And maybe... You've just kind of hopscotched through life and have never taken this seriously, but you're ready. Then I would say, please come, you're welcome. All who are thirsty, drink. It's free. So with that, let's take communion together. Now, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's today's message from Calvary Baltimore. Thanks for joining us. If you'd like to know more about us, visit calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Our email address is calvarybaltimore1 at gmail.com. To financially support the work God is doing through Calvary Baltimore, go to calvarychapelbaltimore.org and click Give. And if you're in the area, stop by on a Sunday morning. For directions and service times, go to our website at calvarychapelbaltimore.org. Live streams and weekly sermons are available on our website, our Facebook page, and YouTube. You can also watch with our mobile app and on Apple TV and Roku. Search for Calvary Chapel Baltimore on these platforms for instant access to great Bible teaching and encouragement. We hope you've been blessed by this week's teaching. Until next time, as Pastor Josh says, study the Word, to live the Word, to share the Word. And join us again for the next Calvary Baltimore Weekly Sermon.